Hello and welcome to Discovering Gray's Lake, unveiling the stories and people that make our town so unique. I'm your host, David Wool, and I'm thrilled to bring you this new podcast that explores fascinating stories and experiences of local business owners and community leaders right here where we call home. It's time to unleash your style with custom shirts. Explore endless possibilities with jammin' tees. Jammin tees. Jammin tees. Whether it's for school, business, team, or events, jammin' tees. Jammin tees. Jammin tees. Has you covered, literally, for all your custom apparel needs. Jammin tees. Jammin tees. Jammin tees. Jammin tees. Hey there, Grays Lake. Looking for a good time right in the heart of our awesome community? Well, look no further than the Grays Lake Village Center, your one-stop destinations for all things fun and fabulous. Picture this. Historic downtown vibes with a mix of diverse businesses, shopping galore, and restaurants that'll make your taste buds dance. But that's not all. The Village Center is where the action is, with events happening year-round for the whole family. Take a stroll through Central Park, Gelatin Park, surrounded by trails, green spaces, and more activities than you can shake a sledding hill at. And when the weather warms up, dive into the Grays Lake Aquatic Center for some splash-tastic fun. But wait, there is more. Visit GraysLakeVillageCenter.com to discover the incredible lineup of events happening every month. Want the 411 delivered straight to your inbox? Sign up for the Grace Lake Village Center digital newsletter on the website or check out their Facebook page for the latest happenings. Be in the know. Not sure what you're waiting for? Come on down, soak in the local vibes, and enjoy the experience that's unmistakably Grace Lake. Grace Lake Village Center, where the fun never stops. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to yet another episode of Discovering Gray's Lake. Hope everybody's doing great today, and thank you for listening. I appreciate all of you. Uh, recording here again, I am at Agora on the corner of Center and Atkinson. Thank you to Luke for having us here. Um, Agora is a co-working space where you guys can rent an office. Uh, just walked by a guy who's just doing a Zoom call here because um, he needed a little privacy. So if you need an office for a day, for a week, or a lifelong home, uh, Agora is a great place to be. So come over and talk to Luke, and thank you out to Agora. So this morning, I get, uh, I guess I got you a lifelong friend. Yes. I, I could tell you, actually, the very first time I met you. All right. Well, and I don't we're talking to Penny Dawn, yeah. first of all. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know the first time you met me. Okay. And I don't know if you'd remember this, but I was thinking about this. I, I was a senior in high school, and I was at a kegger that I'm sure neither one of us bought a solo red cup for. No. Um, no, we were no. good people back then. Absolutely. But, and now. But uh, I, I met you and I thought you were someone else. And I had I had gone there with Che Kirby and Shannon Aker. And they're like, no, that's a different Dave. So that's when I met you. Okay, which Dave did you think it was? I don't even remember. Because <laughs> people used to, um, anybody that knows these guys that listen, um, they always thought it was Dave Appleby. They thought me that's and him the were name. brothers. That's the name. That's the name. Yes. Me and him would go around and they thought we were. Yes. And, and he had a brother also uh, mark yes yes, yes that's yes that's yeah. him. i would like to go on record and say that dave appleby is one of the best looking humans on the planet absolutely i think that's 200 uh, percent. Yes. <laughs> yes exactly okay so we've known each other since high school then yes yes okay because i went to carmel you were at where you i went to antioch high school you went to antioch i high did school? go to antioch high school because you grew up in like the lake lindenhurst lake villa okay. mm-hmm. which is funny because we have friends through there that are weird occurrences through my college roommates and Absolutely. things like that. Absolutely, yes. Uh-huh. Okay, so you grow up there uh-huh. and you go to Antioch High School. So yes. how do you get to Grays Lake? I went to Northern Illinois University mm-hmm. where I met Don Steffen, whose family has been in Grays Lake longer than my family's been in this country. And they were great friends with my parents. Yes, yes. yes. And they all, all everyone went to St. Gilbert. And mm-hmm. um, so that's, I married Don and... And here and, you are in Grays Lake. That's, yes. That's how you get here. Yes, and he's no longer here, but I'm here. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad that you're here. <laughs> I'm really glad that you're here. Um, so growing up through everything, and Penny and I, just so everybody knows that there's going to be a new show coming out calling the Fifty Shades of Grace Lake. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, we're just going <laughs> to uncover all dirt, but this will not be my voice or her voice <laughs> when, we, when we do this, because we're talking about everything that happens that as we grow up and now... I mean, you're an adult, but when I get to be an adult, it'll be a lot, <laughs> lot more fun things to talk about. Um, so we have books in front of us, and um, I, I want to start there because we were kidding around last night. As you, I'm like, okay, like I'm asking Penny to send me a bio because I want to know about your writing. So um, how did you first get into writing? I started writing when I was about seven years old. Whoa. I lived in a haunted house in Lindenhurst that my mother will insist was not haunted because they built it in 1975. Uh, Things what, don't get haunted after 70-something? My mom thought only old houses were haunted, and I've lived in my fair share of old houses that are haunted as well. 
but this house had a strange energy to it. I shared a room with my sister and nothing ever bothered her, but I had my hair pulled, my toes tickled, um, constant voices of go in the closet. Uh, in the middle of the night, I was up all the time, and one day I finally just went in the closet and sat. We had this huge walk-in closet that I'm sure was about four by four, but I was little. <laughs> um, and I sat down on the floor, and I said, okay, I'm here. Now what? You know, what else do you do when you can't dare to wake your mom because she works two jobs? And I was terrified, and I went in there, and there was a notebook and a pencil, and I started writing. And I've been writing ever since. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's um, inspiring and terrifying all at the same, t- <laughs> at the same Imagine time. Imagine being seven. <laughs> right. Now, when you say you've lived in your fair share of haunted houses, yes. are you sure it's the houses and you're not bringing it with you? Oh, I'm probably bringing a fair amount. I mean, I, writers are not born of safekeeping, as I don't know if you've ever heard that before. No. Uh, but we, we go through some trauma. And, well, some of us do. Um, I did. And I think that for certain, I perpetuated a lot of what I've experienced, Um, but I've had some that are just genuine. It was there before I got there, and it's there when I left, so for certain. Do you have any idea what kind of stuff you were writing at seven in a haunted closet that you were summoned to? Oh, um, the very first story I do remember, I don't remember, what because I used to write in there all the time because I could go in there, leave the light on, and write when I couldn't sleep, and then let my sister sleep, mm-hmm. uh, because we shared a room. Even when we uh, got our own rooms, we always slept in the same room, because mm-hmm. the house was haunted. <laughs> uh, but no, the very first story I wrote, I remember thinking um, about if I was on a carousel, and I couldn't get off of it. So it was this perpetual carousel ride. That I was writing about and um, ironically never finished the story. <laughs> That's a terrifying story actually. Yeah. Wow and you've never finished that story? No I, I should write it now and uh, that'd be kind of fun but I was a creepy child and I wrote creepy <laughs> things. <laughs> okay so from seven moving forward mm-hmm. you continued writing. I wrote yes. Um, what kind of stuff did you like to write? It sounds like some creepy stuff? Yeah, I always, I read a lot of mystery. I was an avid reader as a child. I mean, my mom would tell you that I was speaking in full sentences, complex sentences by the time I was two or three. Um, always, English just made sense to me. Languages make sense to me. So I was always writing. Um, so I, I liked mysteries when I was younger. So I would read mysteries. I would write mysteries. And then as I got older, uh, I went to, after After my undergrad, I got my master's in writing at Seton Hill University in Pennsylvania. When my girls were about three and nine months old, I went back to school. And that's where I learned more about the business of writing. And, you know, here I am, everyone is like, no, you're a good writer. All of my instructors, with the exception of one at Eastern Illinois University, my creative writing instructor told me um, that I just didn't have it. And as soon as I got my first publishing contract, I can bet I was sure to call him. Uh, He never liked me anyway. It was mutual hatred. (laughs) Uh, So anyway, um, I learned at Seton Hill that as an unpublished writer, it doesn't really matter how good you are, that you need to throw your spaghetti at the wall where you know it's going to stick. And so what I was writing is mystery, thriller, all that sort of thing. And if you're targeting publishers who publish maybe one or two, maybe four a year, versus, uh, say, a romance, Harlequin, with eight different imprints who are publishing for a month, what are your odds? So I started writing erotica, and that's how I got my start. So you did that purposefully yes. to try to break into Yes, to okay. absolutely. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay, was that a big change in writing? It was. I actually, there's, there's certain elements that are very similar between any kind of horror, murder. It's all very sensual based around the body. Whereas uh, you just it's on a different spin. So erotica is a little more fun stuff that has to do with the body and the murder and the horror is more of uh, the uh, physiological response to terror. Grays Lake, are you ready for some nonstop fun with the Grays Lake Park District? Hundreds of classes, programs, community events, all designed to keep those smiles shining. Explore over 240 acres of parks, each a playground of excitement. Safety is their priority, ensuring a good time for all ages. From kids to the young at heart, the Grays Lake Park District has something for everyone. Grab your seasonal program guide for memories that will last a lifetime. Your adventure begins with the Grays Lake Park District, where fun knows no limits. So it's similar, in, you just have to shift your gears a little bit with your intention, but it's it was a pretty natural, I thought that uh, it was going to be easy to be honest with you yeah. until I'm hooked up with a publisher and I'm 
chili peppers sell books. So you want four chili peppers. In order to get four chili peppers, you need to include this many number of crazy scenes. I say crazy for love scenes right. uh, and because they were crazy. And uh, of those scenes, this type of content in each scene. And some of this stuff, Dave, I had to look it up. I'm like, wow, people do this? <laughs> Okay, you know, um, but of course, then as my mom's reading it, she's like, how do you know about these things? And I can't recommend this to my church friends. That's my star voice. Um, So, I mean, it was an interesting experience. It was more difficult than I thought it was going to be, but it got me a contract. So that's awesome. mm -hmm. How long did it take you to get a contract with that? Uh, I learned about this concept in 2004 when I went back to school and before I graduated, I had three books sold, and I graduated in 2006. Wow. Yes. That's yes. incredible. Congratulations on Thank that, because that's Thank huge. You. Yeah, I was trying to think of, like, what your, you know, your family or your friends when you're, like, writing them, <laughs> like, now is she going under a pen name so they don't know that... Yeah, ironically, I wrote erotica under my actual name. <laughs> Did you really? And I I don't know. I, I think I thought I would just write everything under my actual name. But then right. when I started writing uh, psychological suspense for teens, mm-hmm. there's a little bit of a moral responsibility there to change that name so that the teens don't look up my backlist and start reading about sure. threesomes. <laughs> right. <laughs> that would have been... Horribly which, irresponsible. Which was only one of the chili peppers. That's only one chili pepper, right? right? You mean you need to get into some pretty nasty stuff to get to four. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, I need to start reading more. Apparently, <laughs> I will. I will read, and I'll, I'll give you my um, my review. Okay, um, that sounds. Yeah, because I guess that would be if you have a following of of readers, and then if they find out, is this now? Well, now, Grace Lake's gonna know. Like, all the things, if they don't already know. Sure. My Penny Dawn work was at the library for a time. (laughs) I I, I brought them all in. I'm like, here you go. You know, put them in with the the romance. And so they were up there for a while. And it's been been kind of funny that I've had friends or moms that you knew at the pickup line. And they're like, oh, you know, I I read your book the other day. And one of them even told me, uh, I took your book on vacation and I actually had to pay to have it replaced because it fell in the lake. I'm like, oh, you should have just called me. I would have given you one, <laughs> right. that kind of thing. And then, of course, it's like, well, did it really fall in the lake? What happened to yeah, it? Yeah, I want to know mm-hmm. really what happened yeah, to that. Pages yeah, pages were sticking together. That's a little suspect. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> did you do book signings for those as well? I did. Uh, not a whole lot in the area here, but more... Um, urban areas they did better in urban areas really? um, when right after i was published cbs did a whole segment on erotica and they put this call out to authors and they wanted to interview authors of erotic fit, fiction and they said great you know we can't find anyone that's willing to go on camera about this and I said, really? I'll do it. You know, no problem. Right. And it was me and Robin Schoen. Robin Schoen was a USA Today bestseller at the time. And this was probably after the publication of one of my books. And I had several in the pipeline, but I'm basically an unknown. Uh, and CBS came to my house to talk to me about it. And they even asked me, do you have any readers we can talk to? I said, oh, absolutely. I've got a reader list. And they called everyone on the reader list. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, I love that stuff. But no, I'm not going on camera to talk about why I want to read this. Uh, and they got a real kick. They came to my house over on Oak Avenue, and they interviewed me. And I had to pause the interview to make mac and cheese for my kids because they were hungry. <laughs> That's what we do, right? And they got such a kick out of that that here's this erotica writer, and she's got these two little girls. And hang on, I got Dora the Explorer on in the background, and I got to make mac and cheese. Was that part of the sh- the show in That's, the air of the interview? Yes, oh, they yeah. showed me making mac and cheese. <laughs> Can I find this anywhere? Um, CBS, it was uh, on in San Antonio, it was in Chicago, and it was on the 10 o'clock news, and that's actually, it was kind of a joke that I'm like, actually, this is how my cousin Anthony is learning that I don't write children's books. He's watching this right now, and now he knows that I write erotica, you know? Right. So um, maybe if you go into the, the files, you could find it. I'm sure that I can yes, find it. Yes, yes. I was wearing a cute pink outfit, so. All right, that's yeah, what I like. It's yeah, probably the thumbnail it's all that there. really matters is right. the pink outfit. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the stigma that comes behind that, which just funny because everybody talks about sex everybody talks about all these things but if you're writing it and publishing it then Mm -hmm. I'm sure people did you have any shame from anybody for writing it yeah I don't think my ex-husband had a whole lot of comfort level with it Um, sure 
and I think that that was because of the assumption that everything I had written about I had experienced. Sure. Uh, not true, obviously. <laughs> but uh, the other thing that I didn't expect was that even though I had uh, seven titles in erotica and they were single titles, so they weren't category romance, but they were single title, uh, that I had a little bit of trouble then finding an agent for uh, what everybody in the world might call serious fiction. Uh, you know, so that, oh, well, you write erotica that's known as lesser. Uh, however, if you pulled all of that out of there and just my accolades and all that sort of thing, you know, I managed to get in there. But th that was a surprise to me that once you're writing that, is that all you're going to write? Sure. Mm -hmm. So you didn't want to be pigeonholed into one thing because you did that purposefully right. to try to break in. Right, and to learn the business. And, sure. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you learned a lot fast. I did. Um, and I did. you still have to be a good writer because I'm sure that there's a ton of erotic writers that are horrible. <laughs> yes. Um, that don't get published. Sure. Well, or, or that are published. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and actually, uh, they actually read a, an excerpt of my first novel. You're gonna love this title, Dave. Measuring up. Oh, and um, by the way, she has a measuring tape in her purse when she walked in. Completely coincidental. <laughs> right. I like, just always have one with this me. This is not show and tell today. <laughs> Okay, so back to measuring up. Yes, they read that on, uh, I think it was, I can't remember if it was B96, but anyway, whoever had, uh, they had listed, they were affiliated with the CBS interview the day before that. It, so they were talking about it, and it was, oh, you know who it was? It was the Eric and Kathy show. Oh, really? I don't remember. That was a remember, popular show. I don't remember. So they read, and they said, actually, this girl can write. I, I was I had two little kids. I wasn't listening to the radio. My father called me. He goes, they're talking about you. you got to turn it on. It was crazy. So I turned it on. I said, okay. You know, and I thought, maybe I should call. But then, you know, one of the girls needed something. So I was, I right. never was part Just, of that. But yeah. it was fun to, to hear people talk about me. Wow. <laughs> yes. Okay. So that's, um, well, great press for that, especially leading up to the interview, you know, to mm -hmm. leading up to that. So did that interview help you sell books? It did. Uh, I, I was with a very small publisher, and at that point, I did have a spike in sales, and I was also then asked to join groups of writers that had uh, more themes, and we write, like, say, four short stories, so I was then grouped with more experienced writers that, you know, more exposure and that sort sure. of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I wanted to talk about, so I want to talk about making the transition from erotica to what you write now. Um, but when you were doing these things, when you would go to book signings or thing, any like creepy people or were they mostly women? That I, is your. I would say probably a nice mix of men and women. Really? Yes. Um, and you know, it's always it's interesting because I would say typically a man's reading, bringing the book home for her, for his wife or for his girlfriend sure. or, or whatever. Uh, but I, I had a couple, it was more email stalking and that sort of thing sure. that was, you know, sometimes got a little scary, you know, like someone, you know, Hey, uh, let's meet up and I'm going to be in Streeter, Ohio at this time. Like, I, well, I'm, I'm not <laughs> strange, right. crazy things. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's funny when you say with, um, because like I, I always look at numbers for listenership, and if it's males listening, it's women listening. Um, but when things get popular like that, like with the erotica stuff, when Fifty Shades of Grey came out, right. the first thing I did about the craze was I went out and bought it, and I wanted to read it, because mm -hmm. I wanted to read the book that every woman was reading. Right, okay. Right? Mm -hmm. So you got to keep in the know. Yes. I didn't learn anything there. I thought there was only like 38 shades of gray, but now, <laughs> now I know more. Um, so, okay, so you're successful writing that. When did you make the change? Are you still writing um, erotica stuff, or when did you make the choice to, to switch it over? Uh, yeah, to I haven't written erotica in a while. Uh, I wrote, um, I probably want to say, I've been writing other things at the end, simultaneously when I was writing erotica, just to keep uh, the, the door open for submission. Uh, when you write romance and erotica, you really don't need an agent to make a sale, but anything else you really do. <laughs> so I had been writing and submitting, and Andrea Somberg of Harvey Klinger in New York City, uh, I have a friend, Jessica Warman, who's a brilliant writer. She's based in Pittsburgh area, and we went to grad school together. She introduced me to Andrea, and Andrea read pieces of my manuscript and said, oh, you know, I really like this. Do you have more? And I'm like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Had nothing. But, you know, and I'm you know, frantically writing from 2 to 5 a.m. before the girls wake up. And uh, piece by piece, she read it. And that was Oblivion by Sasha Dawn. And she picked it up. And instant, instantly, I think it was at market for maybe two, three weeks. So it was really, it was a, a nice win for me. 
Uh, yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. explain to people like at market for for that length of time. That's a short time for something. But to it was there. good timing. I think that it was um, right before Frankfurt Book Festival, and uh, Andrea happened to know a couple of publishers. Uh, Greg Ferguson was with Egmont USA at the time, and they had done a couple of deals before. And he, this was this perfect kind of dark, moody teen fiction that he liked, and she knew he'd been looking. Uh, so we, and uh, Simon Pulse, which is a, an imprint of Simon & Schuster, they had been kind of looking for the same thing. And I was under consideration at Simon & Schuster for that entire time. And then when Greg offered, we said, well, do you want to match? And that's when they backed down. Uh, super happy with everything that happened, though. It was it was a whirlwind experience. Wow. And fabulous. Great validation. Wow. And you opened my eyes to and any young writers that are out there or people that are in the business of that. It's a hell of a lot more than just writing the book. Oh, absolutely. That's uh, probably one-tenth of yeah. the process. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm sure from the editing to your publisher right, to right. actually signing a good yeah. deal and making the right choice for yourself you know, financially, too, to right. put the stuff up. Right. You to just do. weren't writing for fun. Well, I mean, I probably, when it's that compulsive for somebody, you're probably writing anyway, but the payday helps. <laughs> sure, it doesn't help. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't have to be rewarded for, for what you're right. liking to do. And actually, in Oblivion, my characters went to Carmel Catholic, and I know you went to Carmel Catholic. Did they Catholic. really? Mm -hmm. I was not one of the characters that got knocked off or anything, were they? No. Okay, good. I don't think we killed anyone in that book. What a boring book. Yeah. Yeah, Some so no one does. Well, well, we're not going to tell you more about the book. So mm -hmm. if that was, so Oblivion was the first That was my book. first breakthrough novel, yeah. Awesome. Do you know <laughs> any number, I don't know if you can like how many copies of that did you sell? Do you have I, any idea? I have no idea how that one in particular, but I've sold over 100,000 all in, so. It's amazing. <clears throat> Thank you. Right, what's the second book then? The second book was um, a book called, I called it Gone, uh, and this book was called uh, Splinter. They, they said there's too many books called Gone, so uh, they named it Splinter, and that one did pretty well as well. Um, that one, uh, I actually used the basis of my house over on Oak Avenue uh, and some some lore that uh, from mixed with another house with an underground tunnel from one house to another, so that was super fun to write. Um, Wow. Yeah, great fun. Um, that was, and that one was picked up. So Egmont went back over the pond. They didn't want to stay in the USA. Can't imagine why. And so they went back to England, and uh, Lerner bought them. So Lerner published my next three. Wow. Mm -hmm. Are those uh, books a series, or are they just standalone All standalone stars? fiction. Wow. I would love to write a series. I don't, I think I, I get bored with my characters, and they stop listening to me, so I move on. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that they're from from my opinion, it's kind of fun to write one because you can jam everything in there. But I'm sure you get done, and how much stuff is left on the editing floor that maybe you thought was great oh, that absolutely. you wish you could include. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I learned from Greg Ferguson over at Egmont, um, and he now is doing more graphic novels and things like that. But we keep in touch occasionally. He was uh, he would tell me, Penny, are you keeping this phrase because you think it's beautiful? I'll tell you it's beautiful, but we don't need it. So he said, if it's going to make you feel better, cut it and put it in a file of all these beautiful things you've written. And he goes, but we don't need to share this with readers in this context. So Interesting. actually, I had, uh, by the time that I was done with Oblivion, I probably had as much cut as what ended up being on the page. <laughs> so, wow, that's unbelievable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's only so much real estate, right? Right, right. Um, so when you write that, do you have, and like when you start writing a book, do you have any idea like this book is going to be X amount of words or 300 pages or I'm I do. sure that you have yeah. to stay in a parameter too what your publisher wants and what sells if it's too long, right. too short, right? Yeah, and we heard that about Oblivion because it was teen fiction, but it was 400 pages and it's like, gasp. We want teens to read 400 pages? Yeah, yeah, go ahead and read it. If you if you don't want to read that, don't pick that book. Uh, but it was a complex story. I needed every single page. Um, and then others that you know that are going to be a little lighter, that you maybe only need 300 pages. And the editors help. They're, I mean, once you have that book contract, it's no longer my baby. It's our baby. And definitely it's a collaborative process. I can't do it without them, and they can't do it without me. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you have anything to do with the marketing of the books? Well, they do most of the time. Cover design, they'll, they will they send me a questionnaire, I fill it out, um, what do my characters look like, what's the, the, um, the, the ambiance of the book, that sort of thing. They come up with a cover that they think will best sell, 
And then, uh, you know, they'll send it maybe to Kirkus Reviews or a school library journal, that sort of thing. They send it to the heavy hitters where maybe an independent can't get their book in for a review, but then everything else is on me. So any type of social media, and it's uh, actually, I'm revamping my website right now. I just pulled it down a couple months ago because I wasn't happy with um, where it was going. Um, so all that sort of thing, tweeting or whatever they call that now, yeah, Xing. Right. It's just the verb doesn't really work. It really doesn't. No, really, no. I don't think that was thought through. No. Uh, Facebook, you know, all that sort of thing, um, reader lists and, and definitely other author interaction um, and events you know you have to do events so wow mm -hmm. yeah because that i think that is the hardest part because i have a little history in that of like how do you get in front of the right people especially because now your market is teens that read this sort of book right right, right. and how for, for get... sasha but then yes for sasha, yes, yes. brandy yeah. writes other things there's three of us in this body yes okay so we're talking to um to sasha to penny and to brandy yes correct okay mm -hmm. who am i talking to right now Oh, I don't know. We, you don't we, know. We switch off. <laughs> we switch yeah. off. This is probably, uh, since we're talking about the teen fiction, would be Sasha. Um, but then the, more of the the business part of it is Penny, I would say. Uh, okay. Yeah. Good. Because I think the majority of the people that listen um, to this show, because I know, you know demographic-wise and things, so uh, a mom or a dad mm -hmm. listening to the show, they're in the right demographic where they have teen children. So... Which would you recommend if you have an avid reader at home? Like, what would you say if you're going to pick up a book by you? Okay. What should they get? So some of this is going to depend on the age of the children. Okay. Uh, Oblivion got a 16 and up rating. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Think about hmm. that. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm. They're all melding. No, Oblivion is probably 14 and up. So there's some there's some dark elements in there, but I keep a fair amount off the page. Blink. Um, I was nominated for an Edgar Award in 2019 for Blink. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I was a finalist of five best teen mysteries in the country. So that was wow. really. I didn't win, but that was super fun to well, be nominated. Well, you won by being nominated. Yes. And what's so funny about that is I based that character on my husband Josh, and so that I I won an a nomination for an Edgar based on his childhood. It was that scary. <laughs> wow. I'm not sure to say congratulations, Josh. Or I'm sorry. No, I'm kidding. A fair <laughs> amount of it was, um, a fair amount of that was just, uh, is all elaborated, but a lot of his struggles as a teen I put into that book. Uh, and that one was a little darker. That got a 16 and up rating. And then I've got, um, 14 year old for, um, panic and for splinter. And, Coincidentally, those are the two that I named the main characters after my daughters. So Splinter stars Samantha and Panic stars Madeline. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so everybody knows that you have two daughters. How old are they? Uh, Sam's going to be 23 at the end of the month. Oh, my God. Which, yes, you probably can't believe. No. And Madeline is 20. She's out in L.A. She's at CalArts, and she's acting. Is she, she really? Yes, she just wrapped a movie. So she's... How exciting. Mm -hmm. That is great. I can't believe that we have children that age. First we of all. don't, Dave. That's, we don't. No. Yeah, somebody told me I almost have a 20-year-old the other day, and I was like, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> right. It really happens, though. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. Well, you must be super proud of them. I'm super proud of both of them. Samantha's actually still teaching here. She teaches at the Grace Lake Dance Connection, so awesome. and she's going to be building a house here. She's going to stay. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. All Madeline right. will never come back, but Samantha's staying. She's staying. <laughs> So we're going to switch gears really quick because mm -hmm. I want to talk about Dance Connection. Okay, um, yes. And, and Bridget, because I think that's through how long I knew you, one of the things that I learned about you that I, it just came to me, that you used to teach tap class, is that right? I didn't teach at the Dance Connection, no. but I took tap class. You took tap at, class. With, with Pat Foster. for oh, yes. Before my daughters were at the Dance Connection, I was dancing at the Dance Connection. And uh, I, taught, um, I taught dance at McHenry County College. So that was super fun. Um, wow. Yeah. So you've been tied to a dance connection for a long time. Yes, and actually I still write the narrations. Do and you really? Yes. Oh, you wrote the ones that I had to read a lot. And That's I was right. I was mad at you, you a lot like, of the time. This word works when you're looking at it, but it doesn't work when you say it. I should have told you, you can change anything oh, like that. I'm was, not one of those ego-ridden. It was probably my <laughs> nice way of saying, Penny, I have no idea what the hell that means. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you know, my ex-husband used to say, Penny knows a lot of big words, and she likes to use them, because I guess I would do that when we argued. Oh. So. Well, it's a good way to use them. <laughs> I need to learn more big words so that you can insult people better, and then they have no idea what you're saying. Or maybe you're just being kind. You were trying. I was just, just being, being sweet. Kind. That's right. right. Mm-hmm. I understand that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and speaking back to Dance Connection, anybody that hasn't listened to Bridget's podcast, um, I really enjoyed, she's just such a wonderful woman. Oh, she's lovely. Uh, Most people have no idea what to do with their aging loved one who needs help. Well, there is a solution. A company that provides care and assistance to make your loved one feel right at home. At Right at Home, their mission statement is to improve the quality of life for those they serve. They offer extensive services personal and companion care, safety supervision and transportation, fall prevention, dressing and bathing assistance, medical reminders, meal prep, hospice support, ambulation support, stroke recovery, Parkinson's support. The list goes on and on and on. If you have an aging loved one that needs help, call right at home. Most people prefer to age in their home rather than moving to an assisted living or nursing home. Right at home can make this happen. Contact right at home at rightathomenlc.com or give them a call, 847 847- Nine eight four zero one zero three. Now back to the show. So yeah, Bridget's has been one of the most listened to um, podcasts, and the the difference she's made in our community. And talk about just a nice, sweet woman who really, really cares about what oh, she does. I have a, a story about Bridget yes. that that absolutely personifies her. All right. So uh, the summer of twenty ten. Uh, this was shortly after. Uh, my ex started taking the girls for vacations without me and I was going through breast cancer treatment and I like I said I've been dancing at the dance connection I saw for a time I took both Pat's class and Bridget's ladies class and ladies class in the summer was a little bit lighter because people have kids and they're busy with their kids but you know my kids were um, were gone on Monday nights they were with Don so I went to ladies class and the schedule was a little different during the summer. Uh, and I ha- I was going through breast cancer treatment. And so my mind wasn't where it was. And I would show up at the studio and I'd be the only one there. Bridget would be like, let's get started. Well, I found out after that summer, anytime I showed up, she'd be like sweeping the floor or something. Oh, let's get started. And sometimes it was just the two of us taking the class together uh, that she taught. And And then I found out later, she's like, oh, yeah, you know, class didn't really start until 7, but you showed up at 6.30 because that's the time that it used to start. And she told me this, like, months after the fact. And she's like, but I knew you had a lot on your mind. I figured, let's just dance. Let's just dance. And she really made that entire that entire summer for me palatable. You know, I was at the Dance Connection all the time for my girls. But, you know, the fact that she didn't she didn't say, hey, listen, you can't get this through your head. Class doesn't start till 7. You know, sometimes I'd show up at 6.45 and be like, sorry, I'm late. And she'd be like, oh, don't worry about it. Come on in. So she never told you. Super, not until way after. Super gracious. And she would just hold class whenever I walked in the door. And fabulous, fabulous lady. I don't know what how I could have gotten through that. You know, I was single. I was going through the treatment by myself. I had two little kids. And she just, oh, come on in. No, we don't have to sweep the floor now. No, you're right. It's time for class, even though it wasn't. <laughs> She is amazing. She is. She is amazing. So mm-hmm. I'm going to make a, a Grace Lake uh, confession here, but I, and I told her I wasn't going to tell anybody, but I'm going to tell everybody. <gasps> um, so during the, um, when we did their bachelor auction to help the Cunningham family, um, I got a call from Bridget. Sorry, Bridget. Um, and Bridget wanted to make a very nice financial donation to the family. And I said, well, Bridget, I'll make Dance Connection um, one of the sponsors of the show. And she goes, no. I don't want any of that. I don't want any of that. I want to try to help this family. And if you don't reach your goal of money that you are trying to get to, I'd be happy to donate whatever money you need to reach your goal. She's incredible, isn't yeah. she? I have like tears running down my face yes. right now. because and it's crazy like, talented, uh, heart of gold. Yeah. And I'm so happy that my daughter is now continuing her career under Bridget's tutelage. Yeah. There is no better testament. Isn't that awesome? Mm-hmm. And think of all the young women and men that she's inspired along the way. Oh, my God. Are you kidding? And just out of the mm-hmm. goodness of her heart, mm-hmm. too, and mm-hmm. keeps on rolling through. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. There's your advertisement, Bridget. We love you. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, it's just wonderful that our town is filled with, with people like that. Absolutely. It's extraordinary. And think about, like, where your girls are at. And mm-hmm. They didn't have Miss Bridget, maybe, and... Oh, and, they and both walked too. through those wow. doors when they were three years old and never left. Wow. Mm-hmm. 
And you were even dancing there. I was. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So we we've got we're going to come back to a couple book things, um, but I want to talk about why you have measuring tape in your <laughs> in your purse. <laughs> And I know it's not because of what we talked about earlier. No. Um, well, my day job is I'm a kitchen designer. I'm a cabinetry specialist, historical home specialist. I've actually designed a lot in town here. Uh, I designed most of the house over at 21 Oak Avenue that is no longer in our family. Which I think is the coolest house in Grace Lake. Thank you. Thank yes. you. It was super fun. I think I draw that, drew that for five years um, before Don and I started putting it together. And i um, you and I actually lived in one of the same houses, not at the same time. Right. <laughs> but I. I, I could have used your help. <laughs> <laughs> that one, I did. I did some work on that house, but not a whole lot. But I've I've designed a lot in in the town. Um, I love working on old houses, and we know that this town has a plenty of them. Yes. Uh, it's. I'm a historian, so it was super fun learning about the Churchill House. It was built in 1906. Um, the house on Oak Avenue. So the Churchills built that house. Really? Tell me more about that house. It was a Sears catalog house or a Montgomery Ward catalog house. What? Uh, yes. So back in the day, they would uh, you could order a house with all the fixins through a catalog, and they'd drop it off, and the town would build it. Really? Yeah. Well, How do I not know anything about this? Well, you probably don't run in the same circles. <laughs> I, I, you're, a, you're absolutely correct. Not I mean, I'm that. a total house geek. you got to be a house right. geek to know stuff like that. So so that actually was just picked out of a catalog. It was a catalog. Out and there's there are a couple of them. There's one on, uh, I think it's Lincoln in Libertyville. That's the same footprint. That used to be the same footprint. You wouldn't recognize 21 Oak Avenue for what it used to be. But uh, absolutely. And I've run into them. Uh, there's one, I think, out in Hebron, Harvard area. You know, but Churchill bought the kit and they built the house and then when he was I don't know if he had died or if they were moving his grandson John Baumgartner bought the house from the estate and uh, I learned a lot about that house from the Baumgartners you know they uh, I'm gonna use the word raped that house in 1967 because that's what you did when you remodeled in 1967 you took out all this Victorian charm and you put in melamine and pegboard uh, uh, yes, that uh, was devastating. Um, Don and I bought that house. Um, we did see the house before we bought it, but um, he was traveling for work, and I found out at the drugstore. Remember the drugstore where Emil's is now? Right. I, I was well. there, and I overheard someone saying, oh, the Baumgartners are moving, and this was the house that Don wanted since he was eight. Uh, he loved the house. It was right across the street from his parents. Right. And so I called him, and I said, um, that house is going to be for sale, and he just said, buy it. And I said, well, okay, you know, do you want to go look at it? He's like, well, sure, but you buy it. <laughs> so I called them instantly, and I said, this is who I am. She's like, wait, who'd you marry? Who are you? And I'm like, I married Don Jr. And so uh, we went, we bought the house, and then I cried for about an hour and a half as John Baumgartner was telling me everything they pulled out of it. <laughs> right, what it could have yeah. or what it was. Yeah. Leaded glass, um, sliding door dish cabinets, and tilt out flower bins, and all kinds of fun things like that. That I, you know, I tried to put the character back in, but that was definitely uh, more of a replication than a restoration when we did that, but um, super fun. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. So you've worked on many homes in Grayson. I have, okay. I have. Mm-hmm. Um, any other big historical thing? Because I always like when people are listening, like, I love these random facts yes. or things about our town that maybe people don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that house, my daughters, uh, they experienced a lot of paranormal activity in that house. In that? In that house. Uh, okay. As children, um, and... So Sam and I, when she got old enough, I think she was, when I say old enough, she was about eight maybe, sure. and we went to the Historical Society to learn about if there were any other reports of this place being haunted, and Charlotte Renahan said, I know for a fact that house isn't haunted, and Samantha said, oh, I, I beg to differ. <laughs> I could see her arguing with yeah. Charlotte. That would yeah, be funny. Yeah, and she did, and she and Charlotte had a great conversation, and, and Sam actually volunteered at the Historical Society in high school for a time. It was really a pretty cool connection. Um, but the, uh, the, the deal was, what we had ascertained, was that we were changing a lot about the house. It hadn't been changed in a very long time, and that maybe uh, I had plumbers that wouldn't go into the basement alone. You know, I mean, this was, they're like, there's music that plays down there. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you'll hear that, and like, well, that doesn't freak you out. I'm like, well, is it hurting you? No, I'm just let them play their music. You know, let them, let them have a good time. Really? You know, yes, and they wouldn't go down there alone. Uh, so it was definitely very real. But uh, one of the things that was interesting is that 
there was a window in the attic that had blown in during a storm. And um, I was pregnant with Madeline. So my father-in-law, Don Sr., went up to the attic to fix it for me. And this window, he said, it's strange. There's a, I was never up in the attic. What am I going to go up a ladder for? Uh, which I do now all the time. But he said, there's an etching in this window. And it was the name Gladdy, G-L-A-D-Y. And so this, uh, this etching, when we redid the house, I pulled that window out and I installed it between the kitchen and the butler's room. So you can still see the name Gladdy etched into this window. Uh, it's fabulous. So what people used to do back in the day, and I don't know when she wrote her name in that window, what year it was, but when a young woman would get engaged, she would get a diamond and she would scratch her name and the date she got engaged typically on a pane of glass so that she could see if her diamond was real. Wow. Uh, more important, I would think, for the fathers than for the young woman. But um, <laughs> I just always thought that was fabulous, that here's this Gladdy in my house, and she was here at a happy time in her life because, that, in my mind, that's why she scratched her name into that window. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing story. Yeah. And if you go to, they took a whole plantation, which was Thomas Jefferson's boyhood home, uh, in the dining room. All the Randolph women had etched their names in with their diamonds, so and those windows are still there. So this is a time-honored, really revolutionary era. Wow. It's, it was an event that happened throughout. And if you look in old houses, especially on the East Coast and in the, in the colonies, the 13 colonies, you'll see a lot more of them because they keep their windows. Right. Mm-hmm. Wow, who would have known? I, I would have no idea about that. Does any of those story, any of that stuff, ever make it into your New York books or anything? Actually, I'm writing right now about a book, a book that is taking place in Grays Lake, oh. and um, it will hopefully be at market by fall. That's a tall order. I've got to yeah. wrap that sucker up. Yeah, I don't know what you're doing here. <laughs> <You should laughs> well, I only write between two and five in the morning. Oh, okay. Uh, so yes, this is perfectly fine. But I, I actually have I call the town Parker's Landing, which was the town's original name. And all the businesses are there. The Dance Connection's in the book. Fred's Diner's in the book. Charlie's is in the book. Uh, St. Andrew's is in the book. So, And I, I have, I picked out a couple of houses where Molly and her Aunt Star live. And, you know, that's, it's super fun because I'm, I'm taking all of the lore that we have in the town. And mm -hmm. that attic window is in the book. That is mm -hmm. awesome. Can you add a black school bus to the book? Sure. Okay. I should. <laughs> that, that, yes. I'd be so honored. Absolutely. I'd be so honored. I'll do that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So you've lived in um, other houses. That we're talking about the the house that we both lived in at different times on Harvey. Yes. Um, and before we started recording, I told you that that house there's just bad choo choo in that house, and it, there's yes. something haunted about that. Yes. And I agree. Yes, yes. Absolutely. What makes you say that? There is a certain energy in that house. Um, I will say that my daughter, Madeline, so when we were in that house, the girls had the two bedrooms that were upstairs and I was on the main level. Yep. So I would hear her giggling in the middle of the night. And she was, when we moved there, probably three or four little. And so I'd go up there and I'd be, what are you doing? And she said she's talking to her friend, Tracky. 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 Okay. That's what she named him. And sometimes Tracky was a boy and sometimes Tracky was a girl and Tracky could shape shift. It was not always a person at all, you know. Um, and, you know, Madeline very, um, not just, she was so young that she was, it didn't matter to her if it was a male spirit, a, a female spirit. But this, whatever it was, this entity uh, would kind of get her into trouble. You know, I thought this is an imaginary friend. Sure. Um, but this imaginary friend had challenged her because of the the scene in Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark when they're doing the shots on the table. Yes. Tracky challenged Madeline to do 100 shots of Dixie Cups of Water, and she did it. And she's like, I have to finish. Tracky's making me do it. And I'm thinking, this child, what is going on in her mind? Right. Uh, you know. But then as she got older... I asked her, you know, usually children know it's an imaginary friend. Of course. Uh, she said, no, he was an absolutely a, a real person. This real person came to see me and would want her to do devious little things, like made her write her name on the wall, you know, all that kind of thing. And, you know, very, yeah. Wow. The, the kind of energy there. Um, and I would feel things. Usually it was after sundown, the energy of that house shifted. Absolutely. Yeah. And because I write in the middle of the night, and I write what I write, 
Sure. It, I know sometimes I'm like, am I just imagining this? But definitely, I don't know if you ever saw shadows in that house, but that house is full of shadows. Full of shadows. Shadows. Especially because I used to sit at the, um, and do my work late at night, right in like the bar area, right next to the kitchen and mm-hmm. sit on there. And there's all kinds of weird stuff that happened out there while I was by myself late at night. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Wow. So Mm -hmm. if anybody thought that um, Penny's crazy, now you can look at me and think I'm crazy. But there's a lot of, and talk about the devious stuff that happened in that room without going into any other things, but Mm -hmm. there's things exactly like that that Mm -hmm. happened. Yes. Um, Which now after you tell me that story, it chills going, oh, okay. It makes sense, right? I I know exactly what you mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. But architecturally, the house is absolutely gorgeous, and cool. I would buy it again in a second. Yeah, yeah. Very Maybe cool. I will. <laughs> Maybe you will. Might, might as well. Yeah, especially if the, if the spirits there are nice, too. Well, we can change that. I can. Oh, you know how to do that, too? <laughs> well, I'm not super great at it, but I've tried. <laughs> okay. Well, well good. Um, okay, so we're going to take a quick break, because I know that you've listened to other stuff, mm-hmm. um, and we are going to do a quick version, because of where we're at um, in time-wise here. Um, to do our little crazy like hot seat. Questions. Okay, let's let's do it. Okay, so here's Penny, Brandy, Sasha. Anything else? No, I think that's it for okay. right now. On the crazy like hot seat. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's time for the crazy like hot seat. <laughs> The Grays Lake Hot Seat today is brought to you by Premier Chiropractic. Dr. John, conveniently located in historical downtown Grays Lake. Premier Chiropractic offers you a full range of chiropractic care. John is dedicated to treating people within our community and showing them the benefit of great, convenient, affordable chiropractic care. So if you're looking to get straightened down, go see Dr. John at Premier Chiropractic. Now for the Grays Lake Hot Seat. Um, And I'll be very interested to hear uh, what some of yours are. Um, so, um, have you ever ate a roller dog from a gas station? No. Okay. Why not? Never appealed to me. Okay. I could eat ice cream before I do that. Okay. I think you should try. And okay. actually they go well together. Okay. Just, just so you know. <laughs> if you had to have a theme party at your house, what would it be? Ooh, um, I would, I think that I would probably do a pajama party, but the twist would be that you'd have to be a famous person coming in the pajamas that you think that famous person would wear. What kind of pajamas I usually would Marilyn Monroe wear? I think that's good. And usually at this point I go, I want to be invited to that party. Okay. But, yeah, I'm going to come and see you, Hefner. Yes, do that. See, but he always wore pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> that's easy, the, easy fix. I'll also stretch that. What is your favorite Grays Lake event to attend? Well, I like the Arts Festival. I'm not, mm-hmm. not surprised coming <laughs> from you. Um, um, so you have listened to podcasts. Um, which is your favorite that you've listened to besides Bridget? You know, I gotta be honest. I I loved watching, listening to you and John Boma. <laughs> I I listened to those back to back, and I was just like, I feel like I need to go get a, a whiskey or something. <laughs> it was so entertaining. I learned so much about John, who who does adjust me as well. Um, fabulous. Had had a great time. Yeah, you had about half of the good times <laughs> since we had that night. And talk about a, uh, an episode that had a zero plan. <laughs> Um, it's just me and him, right. possibly drinking bourbon or something, just sitting and hanging out. Mm-hmm. So those are the ones I love. But a shout out to Johnny. Um, thank you, buddy. And actually, um, John sponsors the hot seat. Thank here. you, John. So he's such a good kid. He is. Dr. Hottie. <laughs> I love when people talk about him like that because I'm like, it's John. <laughs> you don't understand. So yes, girls, keep going. Get adjusted and spending your money because, yeah. It's a really good business plan. I, yeah. Just be awesome. What, be an and awesome, sexy, sexy mm-hmm. chiropractor. I have those eyes. That helps. Right. And mm-hmm. smart. Mm-hmm. He's everything I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. Um, if you had to bring a famous person to Gray's Lake, um, besides just a general downtown um, thing, where would you bring them? Well, I guess a couple of places. I would definitely take them to the Dance Connection. Mm-hmm. But I would probably also take them on a quick tour through the old part of town. All those old houses. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. And we're, I don't think people understand how fortunate we are to live in a town that has such history like that. Okay, your favorite childhood book? Ooh, um, the first one that comes to mind is probably when I was a little bit older, but To Kill a Mockingbird, I used to read that to my brother from the time he was, he's about three and a half years younger than me, and I read it to him every single summer. Really? Yeah, so sometimes we'll, when things are getting kind of quiet at at dinner time, he'll say, pass the damn ham, and he and I know that it's from 
That's the awesome. Kill Mockingbird, yeah. Um, if Penny, Sasha, and Brandy had to start a podcast, what would it be about? Um, ooh. I've, I've actually talked with my friend Mary about doing this. History class in a wine glass. So you drink while you're talking about history. Awesome. And you make history interesting. And maybe you talk about what kind of wine you're drinking. Wow. And then your sponsors could be your, your wine people. Yes. That's good. Yeah. Fun's Winery. I like We're coming. That. Awesome. <laughs> That's fantastic. I hope that you do that. Um, what's the first concert you ever attended? Elton John. Really? Yeah. At, uh, was that Poplar? Poplar Creek? Yeah. Outside. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. You set the bar pretty high for yourself. I did. Oh, no. I did. That's good. Um, first car you ever had? 1994 Camaro was purple. And, That's uh, awesome. Yeah, Don, it was my dad's company car, and I bought it from him, and uh, Don crashed it on 53. He uh, Three of the oh, four Don. panels, but he survived it. It was a miracle. He really should have been hurt. He wasn't. He pulled a calf muscle. I don't know how you did that, Don, but good job. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know, and for some reason that story is extremely familiar to me. Um, <laughs> do you have a go-to karaoke song? Uh, borderline, Madonna. <laughs> um, we've already gone to press, though. Have you ever won an award, and what is the biggest award that you're most well, proud of? Well, probably the uh, the Edgar nomination was the right. biggest one, um, but in my other alter ego, uh, I've won awards for innovation in uh, in home construction, that sort of thing. That's uh, cool. Yeah, I designed the personal kitchen for the Custom Home Builder of the Year about 25 years ago. I was about 26 at the time, uh, and that was super fun. Yeah. Wow. That was a great accolade. Mm-hmm. That's cool. You do so many interesting things. Oh, thank you. And they're very creative. Um, how many times do you exercise per week? Seven. What's your favorite season? Summer. Um, do you have a nickname or how many nicknames do you have? Oh, well, I got a lot of names. Uh, actually, uh, my growing up, we were Jenny, Penny, and Kenny. So we all named each other different things. So they called me Bean. Bean. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um... Uh, how many texts do you send a day? 87. Okay. I've counted. It's your average? <laughs> I, don't, I, have, <laughs> so no, I have no idea. Just all the time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, what's the last thing you purchased on Amazon when you're not shopping locally, obviously? Um, what did... Oh, uh, I bought my mother a Mother's Day gift, so I'm not going to say what it is because she might listen. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Good one. Um, I would never do blank again. Oh my gosh, are you kidding? I'd never get married again. Okay. <laughs> Well, you are married. Yes. Okay, good. But I'd never do it again. That's a good answer, though. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good In the good words answer. of Jack Nicholson, good for the man, lousy for the woman. I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> you are hilarious. Um, what What is something that you really wish you learned sooner? Uh, probably that I am just as important as everyone else is. We were raised, um, my mother would take, and I love you, mom, but we would, she would take perfectly healthy behavior and turn it codependent. And nobody's, nothing anybody I needed was nearly as important as what somebody else might need. So I, I think we were all kind of created that way. And so I wish I'd learned that earlier, that that's not really how it's supposed to be. Interesting. Um, hey, bartender, can I have a I think I'd have an old fashioned. Today. Oh gosh, me and you need to have an old fashioned. That's <laughs> what I'm on this. I'm on the quest for the best old fashioned. Yes. And I'm gonna do a video thing coming downtown Gray's Lake, seeing oh, yeah. where I can get yeah. the best old fashioned. Even though I think I already know, but I'm not gonna. I think you might know. I think yeah. I know too. I th- you might. You might be surprised. Mm. <laughs> you might be surprised. Um, if you had to have a superpower, what would it be? Um, probably time travel. Awesome. Um, a place that you'd like to travel that you've never been? Italy. Anywhere specific in Italy? Uh, my mom's family is from Lombardia and Abruzzo, so I would probably like to see their villages. Very cool. Um, do you have a hidden talent besides all these other things you well, do? Well, we already talked about that I can tap dance. Right. Um, well, I, I, I actually idea. have an odd talent in uh, knowing a lot of things about Thomas Jefferson. Okay. Yeah, I have his signature tattooed on my right foot. I'm a little bit of a... You're a tad bit of a freak about TJ. I'm a Jefferson about TJ. Junkie, yeah. 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 He's the best boyfriend I ever had. Never argues with me, ever. Right. Mm-hmm. He's I, The one thing that I've learned from him, um, one of the most important things he said, that um, don't believe everything you hear on the internet. I think it's one of my favorite <laughs> yes, quotes absolutely. by him. <laughs> yes. Um, shows you how much I know. Um, what's your middle name? Well, I have a compound first name, Penny Dawn, named after my aunts. Okay. And then I have uh, other middle names, Suzanne Teresa. You have a long name. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, have you ever broken a bone? 
Yes. Okay. Uh, how did you do that? Uh, gymnastics when I was about nine. Okay. Um, one to ten, how good of a driver are you? I'm a good driver. I'm, I would say I'm I was very confident. Eight point five, but parking, I'm a two. Okay. I, I can't. I can get somewhere, but you don't expect me to stay there because I can't park where's Jet. Okay. Good. <laughs> well, there's a big parking lot out here, so hopefully. And you'll park. see that I park far away from everyone. <laughs> Thank, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Um, in high school, did you play a sport or a member of a club or anything like that? Yeah, so I was in all sorts of uh, student government things. I was in the art league, and I also ran track. Well, what, what event did you do in track? Uh, 200, so I would do uh, relays and the sprints, all that sort of thing. Nice. I could run a 200 faster than I could run a 100, according to my coach. <laughs> I was bad at 100. <laughs> that is the strangest thing I've ever heard, I think. Um, okay, uh, I'm just going to go with that. With a 12-year-old version of yourself, think you're cool. Are you kidding? Uh, I have. I have just talked about my tattoo on my foot, Thomas Jefferson. 12-year-old Penny loved Thomas Jefferson. That's when she met him. That's when, yes, absolutely, she would think that 50-year-old Penny was balling. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. <laughs> and I love how confident you are in saying that because that's a... Um, it, it, it's a lot to be said, and a lot of people have had trouble answering that question. Or no, twelve years, twelve year olds don't think anybody's cool. That's true. And twelve years of yourself. Yeah, but I was a geeky twelve year old, so I'm good. <laughs> That's true. Um, so okay, well we're gonna we're gonna stop these. Um, so thank you for participating in that. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Johnny, for um, helping us out with Thanks, the show John. too. Dr. Hottie. <laughs> um, okay, so you're working on a new book right now. Yes. Um, is that titled yet? When does that when does that actually come into play? When well, I, I, I will probably title it right before I send it to the agent, but I know that that's just a placeholder. They're going to help me name that book. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that doesn't come in the in the process. That Not you usually. Start I, with I it. think of all of my books. Maybe uh, Blink is the only one that they kept my title for. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you're doing all of these books, do you ever? I know you you enjoy writing. You like it. You have a lot of ideas. Do you ever run into a big writer's block issue? I don't believe in writer's block. I believe in time block. So I run into time when I'm just too busy to write, but uh, no, I just keep writing. Even if I know it's not going to be good and it's not going to make its way into a novel, I just keep writing. And you can always hit that delete key. Just keep going. True. Um, advice to a, a young man or young woman right now that wants to, you know, their dream, or actually not even young. I have a lot of adults that when I ask them if you had to write a book, what would you write it about? Mm-hmm. And many people be like, funny you should say that because I'm writing one now. Um, but somebody just getting started in the process, advice that you would have to them to help them? Uh, One of my grad school professors said, you are already a writer. Just start thinking of yourself as a writer. Anyone who writes is a writer. So that publication, maybe that's a nice validation, but it doesn't mean you're not a writer if you don't have it. Just keep going. Right. And I think what you said just before that, you just keep writing, whether it's going to be right. valuable or not, or right. you, you probably just never know what <laughs> comes out on that paper, too, mm-hmm. depending on what you're inspired by. Correct. Um, Wow, that's fantastic. Okay, so we've, we've covered books. Um, someone listening now and says, i got to get a hold of your books. Mm-hmm. Um, where do they go? What is the best place to find them on? Sure. So if you uh, want to go to a small bookstore, you can just give them my name, uh, and they will order the book for you. So Brandy Reads, Brandy with an I. And that is actually an anagram of my last name, De Bernardis. That's how I got Brandy Reads. Wow. So uh, Brandy with an I or Sasha Dawn. Uh, so you could do that. You could also go to Amazon if you are like me and don't ever want to leave your house. <laughs> right, because you're writing. You just want to deliver there, right? Because you're busy and you have puppies at home and that sort of thing. Yes, that's fine. <laughs> uh, so you could do that. But uh, I am a big proponent for supporting small bookstores. Awesome. Um, so when the, the new one, do you have a, a date for that to come I think out? that uh, the goal is for me to finish it by summer so that we can start putting the feelers out. Not much happens in the publishing industry over the summer, but uh, hopefully it'll be purchased in the fall and picked up. And everyone goes to the Hamptons in the summer. Oh, yeah, because <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, there's something I don't know about that. That's it's just a works. slower time in the industry. You don't really have much going on as far as sales and communication between agents and publishers. It's a little thinner. Interesting. Yeah. It's funny how every industry has something like that, but I right. would never. Know it works that. out really well because it's my busy time in construction, so I'm super busy there. So you get to work busy. all year round no matter what? Like all the time. Right. Yeah, 80 hours a week. <laughs> um, okay, all books just in um, written format. Can you get an audio version of them? You can get an audio version uh, on Amazon, okay. and they're on Audible. 
So, nice. and I haven't listened to them, but I hear they're good. <laughs> okay. So, did you have any hand in picking the narrator? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Okay. Wow. See, that's such a like a it's it, it's fascinating to me because it can make or break like, how you listen to something. Mm-hmm. And I have my one published audio book that I'm like, I think he made a bad decision, but <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny to listen to. And it was the hardest thing for me because I think you'll understand this, that someone who pours, pours their heart and soul into writing, whether it's a self-help book or a novel or anything like that, and have a voice represent your work, mm-hmm. like I took that as an enormous challenge of things. And uh, talk about imposter syndrome of taking somebody's work and then actually reading it and kind of making it your own work. Yes. I will say that for Third Party by Brandy Reads, the, the narrator actually... Uh, we had a conversation via email and it was, uh, you know, she had a couple questions for me and how I wanted her to do ABC. You know, so she really wanted my input and that was nice. Um, but it, I, I really, there's, they choose them and whether or not I would have approved much like covers, you know, mm-hmm. do you like it? No. Okay. Too bad. We're going to go with it. <laughs> kind of thing. You're going to ask your opinion and ignore you. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's funny. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, and we'll, we'll close out this way because I like to keep everything right around um, an hour. Um, tell me some of your favorite things about living in Grays Lake and what do you think makes this town so special to you? I, uh, I've been here since 1994, and walking through town, um, the people are always very cordial, very nice. Um, I like that I feel safe here. I like all the shops on Center Street. I obviously love the Dance Connection. I love the Freeze. I'm actually going to go to the Freeze after this. I'm going to go pick up a Freezy. Uh, it's the architecture here. We don't really think about it because we're not a big city, but the homes here, the original ones here, uh, they they were made with love. You know, you can see a lot of of the, the super specific detailing in these houses, and even as they're getting rehabbed, people are really conscious of that which I think is a nice nod to the historical society. We don't declare landmarks here, but uh, so you have the flexibility to do what you want, but I think it's nice that people keep, they stay in keeping with the, the feel of the village. They do. And I like all the fun things. Uh, how many great parks do we have here? Uh, and all the great events that we do. Yeah, it's a very special place. And mm-hmm. I know people that listen are always like, all right, Dave, there's other towns like this. You know <laughs> what, you know, think you think it's so special people from other towns. I'm like, yeah, but you haven't lived here your whole right, life. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Because there are a lot of things that I think maybe we take for granted. Um, mm-hmm. that, or or events and parks and things like that, but people don't take advantage of. Because you can't sit and live in Grace Lake and say that you're bored or there's nothing to do because there is something for everyone. Always. I think, mm-hmm. I think it's mm-hmm. good. Um, favorite street in Grays Lake with architecture or historically to you? Oh, you had wow. to pick one. Um, I think Oak Avenue is, and I know I'm biased. You're but a little I, biased. I think that is, and it's a short street, but I think it's the prettiest street in in Grays Lake. Um, it's got, you know what else is another cute one is George. That's yeah. another cute one. But they, every single house on Oak Avenue, it just has, they're all different. There's such great character there. Um, they're old. I, I love old houses. So. Obviously. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, especially when you're upset about them updating it, and then you have to try to restore it back to <laughs> the way that you wanted to do it. Um, you think you'll live in Grays Lake your whole life? Uh, I, I don't think so. Um, sure. And that's really got nothing else to do with, except that I have an addiction to Virginia. So I think that I'll eventually move down there once. That's one once addiction that I've not heard of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but now I know. Yeah, there a lot of really pretty old houses in Virginia. So. Mm-hmm. Um, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay, anything that we haven't talked about that you want Crazy Lake to know about you, about the work you're doing, about anything special that you'd, you'd like to mention? Well, one of the things that I learned about when I listened to Z, yeah. I didn't know there was an author fest. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Why are hey, you not at Author Fest? I, I don't know, but hey, can you look me up, Z? I'll, I'll join you for the <laughs> next sure one. I'm sure Z is, Z listens to a lot of stuff, so Z you better be listening, right? Yeah. So, um, and the I actually have I've taught at CLC. I've taught writing there. Uh, I have when my girls were little, I would run pro bono writing workshops at all the schools, and even though they're not at those schools, I'd still love to do it. So if you're a teacher and you're listening, look me up. I'm happy to come in and help instill that love of the, the language for little kids. Um, they have a great uh, library with a great teen section. Uh, I, I love all of that about Gray's Lake. Yeah. 
there is so much cool stuff, and, and I love people that can inspire, because I think I don't think our kids in the in the time that we live in, there's probably a lot less people that are actually sitting down writing than yes. there was mm-hmm. 20 years ago when mm-hmm. they didn't have an iPad and their phone and correct, everything correct. else. Mm-hmm. So I think we need to inspire our kids to do a little bit more of that. Yes. I think that would be great, because sure. I know my kids, well, my daughter does, but... Um, yeah, it's just kind of a lost art of things to actually put things on paper. Right. Do you prefer to write? Or do you pre- well, I mean, obviously you have to type everything out so you can save it. For, <laughs> right. But I'm sure the form of like writing on paper. As is, far as communication goes, I'm much yes. more effective, um, particularly if uh, it's got if if there's an end game, you know, an argument, for example. And when I say argument, I mean um, a trading of ideas. I'm much better at organizing my thoughts on paper than in my head and speaking them. For right. sure. And they can be more powerful and direct as well. Unless you use big words that I don't know what to talk about. <laughs> then I have to look Fewer them up. Fewer tangents that way. True. <laughs> and it's hard to get interrupted and sidetracked when you're trying to get a thought on paper, mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. So there's another good thing to uh, communication-wise to use. <laughs> right. So, well, I thank you so much. Anything else you want to share? Oh, thanks so much for having me. Oh it's been gosh. great catching up. Oh, my gosh. Yes, yeah. we need to um, do more of that because it's oh, funny absolutely. to see, like, um, and I think we need to we need to talk about some of the other ideas that you and I had uh, together. Yes, let's yes. do it. But we can't launch it in Grace Lake though. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe. I, see, I started with the title, and I'm working on the content. Maybe I need to do the opposite way. Yeah. What? However, it works. <laughs> Whatever. Um, well, Penny, thank you so much. Um, Grace Lake, thank you guys so much for listening. Um, no matter where you guys are listening, when you're on Spotify, whether on YouTube, whether on Apple Music, I can't believe people listen so much on YouTube because it's just an audio format, but. Whatever, whatever it takes. Whatever works. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So wherever you're listening, my point is, please subscribe. Um, because on Tuesdays, every Tuesday, you will get an alert. And on Fridays as well, uh, a new person from town that you will get to learn something about. And I think that that helps build community. It helps us know people in our community. And it brings everybody together. And as I always end to, um, we never know what our friends are going through, our family members, or even a stranger on the street. So I encourage everybody to get out there, do one random act of kindness today for somebody because kindness spreads like wildfire, and it really can change people's days. Amen, right? Dave. That's a great message. Gosh. Okay, so now when you're at the freeze today, you have to do something, and then you'll... I sure will. This nice lady did this for me. Mm-hmm. So. I will do that. All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you again, um, Grace Lake. Uh, this is the Discovering Grace Lake podcast. Um, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next Tuesday.